fair warning. <laughs> it's preparing, setting it up. I know any board comments tonight before we get started? Hi, John. Hearing none, we get right into the superintendent's report. 2.01, a budget update. Yes, uh, before I turn it over to Lisa, um, I've been sending out a lot of information. A couple weeks ago, the uh, $1.9 trillion federal act rather complex. We're still trying to learn uh, about all the nuances that that, that entails. Um, we do know that there's a 20% set aside, which which that looks like there's some strings attached to it for gap closing uh, measures, which is good. Um, now, recently, if, if everyone remembers, and I don't know, uh, Lisa may or may not touch on this, but uh, we base our budget on the executive proposal, the governor's proposal, that's usually the most conservative. Um, just this week, the Senate and the Assembly uh, came out with what's called their one house budgets. The Assembly is traditionally the most liberal um, and the Senate is kind of oscillates back and forth. This year, it seems like the Senate's proposal is more in line with the Assembly's. Um, with that, there's you know a lot of speculation about where the aid will end up and, and, and what have you. 
uh, but we really don't know until they come out with an agreement uh, between the executive assembly and senate um, so it's it, it makes for a very complex process the federal aid is another factor that we traditionally don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time diving into this year we do um, and uh, and so we are we do we are encouraged by what we're seeing but i just uh, just kind of you know we 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 aren't done with budget tonight. Tonight, Lisa's gonna update. She's going to give you uh, kind of the fourth draft. It's going to be a fairly complete budget, but we still don't know what our final picture is from, from the aid and, and federal government. So with that, uh, Lisa, if you want to jump into your section. Okay, um, can you let me share my screen? Uh, maybe. <laughs> I tried it. It wouldn't let me. Okay. I'm just, uh, yep. I think you should have the capability now. Okay. Yep. I can find it. Okay. I don't know why I'm not seeing my presentation. <coughs> Can you see my screen here, the budget binder? No, I just see a black screen. Your screen sharing is paused. Huh. Uh, hang on, resume share. How about now? I see a file. Hmm. Open up from that. that uh, uh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Let me try it again. I, I don't know why it's not letting me, I don't see I'm not seeing my budget binder as an option to share. Okay. Um, would you like me to share my? Yeah. Am I doing something wrong or? Uh, I don't know, um, but I can share mine. And if you want to step me through it, then maybe. Sure. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead? I have everything marked out of what slides I want. So. Okay. I just. <clears throat> Now. Okay. There okay. You. Do you want, if you go to present mode and you can go, um, if you hover towards the bottom, you can actually pick what slide you want. Okay. And I wanted to start with um, slide 17. Okay, so this is just a recap of what we discussed at our last uh, meeting, which was a work session meeting on February 23rd. This was a third draft. Um, during this meeting, pending what we will receive in state aid, we seem to have consensus that the board was comfortable moving forward with a 1.64% tax levy increase. Again, that's pending state aid um, if the picture becomes brighter and we end up receiving more aid I the consensus was more uh, of a comfort level of not increasing taxes so in terms of revenue that's where we left off last time and then you can see for expenses we had a change of about forty seven thousand dollars in addition to the budget mostly with our BOCES services expenses we received the final service request forms and we were able to update the expenses as appropriate so this was just a recap of where we left off uh, we balanced the budget by appropriating the difference in fund balance of approximately one hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars, and then the reserve appropriations that remain the same at 
about $470,000. So if you go to the next slide, Jamie, <clears throat> slide 18. So this would be our fourth draft. So these are the changes that have occurred since we last met. Not a lot going on, but you can see for the revenues, I had a slight change when I was uh, going through our tax calculation and I reviewed our pilots. I have to project our pilots and what I anticipate we will receive next year. And I went through the calculation and uh, you can see I have a change in the pilot of a positive about $8,700. Since pilots are factored into the tax cap calculation that actually reduced our tax levy limit prior to adding in any carryover. So rather than the 1.64%, it would be about 1.51%. Basically the tax levy, the new calculation, the pilot offset each other. So it's a $0 change. For expenditures, uh, really the only thing happening, I think the last time we met, I, I did tell you that we did not have the BOCES cross contract final numbers. And since we last met, I did get those figures. So you can see overall a change occurring in our BOCES expenses of about $2,000. So uh, from the last time we met, you can see our appropriated fund balance made up the difference in the expenditure change and went up to about $139,000. Reserves remaining the same so you can see our expenditure budget right now is uh, $24,164,727. That's actually uh, when everything is all said and done, what the board ends up approving is the expenditure plan. Um, okay, how about uh, if you wanna skip Jamie to slide number, or are there any questions before we move forward on that? Okay. Uh, slide 29. So the last time we met, we talked about, we talked quite a bit about the tax levy because as it stands right now, we could go up to a maximum of, I think it's about 3.04% with carryover. This is a chart. Uh, this shows the compounding impact that we discussed the last time that we met. So basically you're seeing this is comparing 0%. So if we do not increase the tax levy in 21-22 versus going up to the 1.51%, which is our tax levy limit excluding carryover. So I was just really painting a picture for you. Uh, you can see from 21-22 going all the way to 25-26. So in a five-year period, what would we lose in tax levy just by not increasing the taxes for one year to 1.51%. And you can see overall, it's just under $530,000 that we end up losing because of the compounding impact. Um, go Now go backwards, Jamie, to 28. Now this is a representation of the impact uh, comparing the maximum that we could go out at 3.04% in 21-22 versus zero. And then you can see over a, a five-year period, it's actually just over a million dollars um, impact in what we could have raised in revenue. Now back up one more to 27. This represents, I, I went back in time, back in since 1213, which was when the um, tax cap was first implemented. And you can see the top chart basically shows in blue, what was our maximum tax levy that we could have raised versus in orange, what did we actually raise? So throughout the years, if we if we go through, this shows actually the second chart goes all the way through 21, 22, what the impact would be over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine years in totals, just under $2 million. That includes 21, 22, assuming that we go out with 0%. 
So just a visual, well, and you can actually see the numbers of, you know, what that means in hopes that, you know, when we do make a final decision, maybe it will have some impact on, you know, how you feel about the situation or it may not, but it was something that was discussed. So we wanted to make sure to give you a picture of what that means. Any questions on that? The compounding? Yeah, I have an, I have a question. Can you also yes. make one what our fund balance would look like if we didn't use those funds? You know if it, I mean? it'd, be, it'd be through the roof. If we don't trouble. use the... Right, like if you, if you go back all those years, because we were pretty low every year and we didn't always go to tax cap, our fund balance would be ridiculous. Oh, you mean if we did go to the max? You know what I mean, like you could do the same thing with our fund balance, right? And project where we would have been with our fund balance also. Right? I mean, you know, I so, so like in 2012, I don't remember how much we used in the fund balance, but if we didn't use it, we could show up projected like that as well. I get compound interest, but I also get about our taxpayers and who lives here. No, I understand, but it was you know, something that we discussed yeah. and something that yeah. I think somebody had asked or they wanted to yeah, see no, it. So we, we yep. put it together. Mm -hmm. um, I know one thing too, going, I'm sorry, did somebody else have a question? Yeah, sorry, Suzanne, what exactly are you asking for? You're asking for a fund rent balance report that reflects these numbers that Lisa just showed us for from 2013-14 to 2021-22. Did we lose you there? I mean, I think what she was saying, and I could be incorrect, but I think she was saying, could we look at the fund balance in the same way and say, you know, if we didn't, if we had raised taxes to the maximum in blue, what would our fund balance have been? If we went, you know, if we went back and projected forward, what would our fund balance have been had we raised taxes? I mean, I do, I get what she's saying. I, I, I mean, I, sometimes it's difficult to know where we would be because in many cases, especially when, you know, our revenue stream is, when we're fortunate, we budget in a, on a year to year basis. And I would imagine that if we had those additional revenues, we, I would anticipate that we would have enhanced program in some way or another, if we had that money, but it's hard to go back because, you know, the history, the past is the past, our fund balance is where we are. Uh, we can't, I mean, I guess we could go back and say, well, had we raised all those taxes, what would our fund balance be today? But at the same time, we have no way of knowing how would we have used that additional money. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate uh, just looking at the scope of this and, and leaning forward. Um, I think it does give us insight. I understand uh, completely what Suzanne is suggesting, and and it is it's a it's a tough it's a tough balance. This is the public's money, um, but it's also the public's program that we're trying to to uh, to run and enhance if possible. Um, but yeah, we asked. Uh, you to create this kind of show what it, the, it would look like with the tax levy compounding, um, and so thank you. Um, but good, good, uh, good dialogue because it is there. We, we are ending uh, this year uh, in, in a positive light. We weren't sure we would uh, about five months ago. I think we had a very different tune um, that that we were all singing. So. So right now, I think that is a, it's good information to have. I appreciate you doing that, Lisa. Uh, does anyone have any questions, any other questions for Lisa? No, oh, thank you, Lisa, for putting that together. I know I asked you to do that. So I think it's, it's really, uh, you know, it shows us the data if we don't go out and where we were at, where Jamie just said, where were we at a few months ago, 
and we're looking at making some dra dramatic changes, this shows us that, you know, we could have avoided some of those dramatic changes if we didn't take a tax loss levy. So it's nice to see the numbers. Thank you. I just wanted to make a general comment as well. And Rob, I understand what you're saying, but we didn't have to make those dramatic changes yet. And that's a good thing. I mean, they're there if we need them at the time being, but uh, I understand. I, I'm, I get both sides of it, Rob and Suzanne both. And Lisa, thank you for doing that. Uh, at the same time, Lisa, you made a good point, which is, you know, we've been trying to bring back things since 2009, 2010 regarding programming. And uh, meaning that, you know, we didn't raise taxes because we felt that the community couldn't support it at the time. And uh, we want to be cognizant of that. But at the same time, we, we do have to look at the fact that we did lose some serious money by do, making those decisions, and which does impact bringing back some programming that we wanted to bring back since then. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword, and we have to kind of, um, you know, think about that in the future, for sure. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, um, well, I just wanted to make a comment. You don't have to go to the slide, but... At the last meeting, John had mentioned the one slide, it, it was separated into two. It was one big long spreadsheet. It was difficult to read. So I created a link to the sheet, which so now it should be easier to for you to view. It was the one on the uh, reserves and fund balance and it's slide 59. Now it's just like I said, it's just a link for you You'll, you'll be able to actually see that um, spreadsheet better. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'll keep, I'll keep talking while that's spinning. Uh, there it is. Do, is that better, John? or for everybody, better for you to view. At the last meeting, someone had also mentioned uh, what would an increase of say the 1.51% mean to the taxpayer. Uh, so I did, I went ahead and I looked at the numbers even though I, I do caution when I provide this because it is never really accurate. Uh, just to give you an idea, last year at this time when building the 2021 budget, I calculated what the uh, tax levy impact would be to a homeowner with a house assessed at approximately $100,000. And the calculation came up with roughly $12 for the year. When I uh, plugged the actual numbers in, because at the time when I do this projection, we don't know all of the information regarding the full value, the total full value of all the towns. When I plug the numbers in today, it's actually a decrease of approximately $30. That's not a perfect figure. You know, I, I can't say that a homeowner with $100,000 is gonna have exactly $30 decrease in their taxes, but that's a, a rough estimate. But you can see the difference between me providing the estimate when building the 2021 budget of a $12 increase and then the actual being a decrease. So I did go ahead and I did the projection for 21, 22, assuming a 1.51% increase. I obviously don't know the actual at this point in time, but the uh, projected estimate would be uh, around $36. That's for a homeowner with a house assessed at $100,000. Um, and I think that covers the budget update and I believe I addressed everything that was uh, brought to my attention from the last meeting. On the calendar, currently we have a budget work session scheduled for March 30th. It, it's uh, an as needed. At this point in time, I'd, I'd like to hold on to that date and as we get closer, if we have more information on the state budget, we can decide to follow through with the meeting or if we don't, we can maybe postpone it to a different date. Thank you. 
Does That's that right. work? March 30th, Lisa? Yes, yes, March 30th. Um, then, I mean, the week after that, we're getting into spring break and I don't know everybody's availability. Um, it probably depends on the state's um, time frame from here on uh, out with, with looking at the three proposals and, and making a, coming up with an agreement so that we can actually get final numbers. Right. Okay. That's all I have, unless anybody has any other questions. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Um, just something, uh, if I can keep going, Mr. President, uh, I've got uh, just, I, I'd like to share my screen again and just go over for the folks at home. Uh, it is uh, in your board backup, but we did get another uh, update from the construction management firm, Watchdog. And just uh, as of last week, we had 8% of the building ceilings have been removed. That Scheduled to be removed. Uh, half of the grid work is not in uh, back in. The lighting is almost completely installed, and this is the new uh, LED lighting. The snow melt system for the sidewalks, about 10% of it is complete, and it's 10% inside, like some of the piping. Uh, we had to shut down a couple of weeks for the water shut And it was basically to do the work for this ice cream system so that when they were ready to roll outside, they can just plug in and go. Um, the security build is 100% done. Auditorium, if you can go in there, it's not really an auditorium anymore. It's a big room. Uh, the seating has been taken out. The floors have been uh, uh, patched and fixed, and they're going to start going in there. Um, and also the cabinetry in the in the elementary. They had to take all the faucets out because they weren't ADA compliant. Um, and a lot of the cabinetry was, was uh, failing. Uh, just water exposure. Uh, that's that's mostly been taken out and a lot of the plumbing has been replaced already. So you can see also the projected work. Uh, it is continuing. Uh, nothing really major. We are looking at possibly doing a water shutdown this Friday late afternoon. The reason is, is as they go into each elementary classroom, they have to shut the water off to work on the, on the, on the water. Well, we have six valves that we found that need replacement. Um, and so they they quickly did did the scan the elementary and they in order to do the fixes on the valves, they need to shut the water off. It shouldn't take long. We won't have to uh, spend anybody uh, to go home. Uh, they just need to, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it is, it'll, they're planning to start this Friday at four o'clock. I just found this out this afternoon. So that is something that is coming up. It's a, it's a stoppage, uh, but, uh, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to cancel school or anything. So it's about a quarter of the way through, uh, and they're just going to probably, uh, continuing on with, uh, with the process that they're in now. Fire alarms are big when they do it. You can see in our second floor in the high school, the ceiling panels are back in, that nice bright LED lighting. The security film, nice bright picture. There's our auditorium. Looks a little different. And then the seating capacity. I'm sorry, uh, the seating capacity, I believe will change a little bit, but not that much. They're reconfiguring some of the rows but the seats themselves, uh, the standard when that auditorium was put in was 17 inch seats. The standard now I think is 22 or 24 inches. So we are looking at kind of maximizing our space to get as many seats in there as we can, still having the two rows. I, I'll get final up. Uh, I, I did get, uh, I did talk about this, but it was a few months ago. I'll, I'll double check and, and get something back up the board. But we are on schedule. We're, we're on pace, which is, is nice for a project. Um, and right now, certainly on budget. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So I will send that uh, update out to the community this uh, coming week. And with that, um, I just, uh, if I could, did you have any questions on the capital project before I roll, roll on? If I could, uh, already just one more thing. I just, I wanted to mention that uh, I meet with the administrative team once a week. And just about every week, I, I ask them to figure out how, how to get more kids. In. And they've done a, a fantastic job. And, and we're pulling kids in as, as much as possible. I will tell you, under the current regulations, we're we're maxing how many we can bring, not have. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly pushing. Can we get one more? Can we get this kid? Can we get this child from two days to four days? What can we do? Um, transportation and the mandate on the buses for this distancing is is uh, challenging us here. We don't have walkers because we don't, the school's not located in the neighborhood. We we have to depend on either uh, the family transporting or the bus. And we could get more kids in if, if uh, we could put more on buses. And right now we're doing our best to try to figure out how to do that. I would like to survey the community about their feeling uh, also, um, just to get some raw data on, on what they feel. Because I, I feel that people would want kids back if, if at all possible, we're trying to figure it out. Right now, the CDC is uh, discussing a report to, to look at that social distancing and shrinking the social distance. Um, we're finding that the best thing to mitigate transfer of the virus is good old fashioned hygiene. The masking has seemed to have an impact. We do have, we do have uh, our kids and our adults that have been doing a great job uh, with masking. The social distancing, we're, we're maintaining it wherever possible. The original DOH guidance said when a six foot distance can't be maintained, you must remain masked. Well, we're with masks, whether we're six feet or not. Um, if the CDC changes guidance, then before we can do much, it has to go to the DOH at the state level, then the county level before it can get to us. Uh, I just want to kind of put that out there that uh, the administrator, we're, we're pulling kids back as much as we can, uh, and we want to do more. Uh, but right now, we're we're running up against the wall with the with transportation. So, quick question on that. They, if it did change to three feet, would we be able to get all the kids back to school? Three feet social distancing. I would say we are. We would be uh, rather close to that. Yes. Um, again, busing on buses. In order to maintain a six foot distance on a bus, on a sixty-six passenger bus, you can only fit eleven kids. We actually do one per seat because each seat acts as a barrier. So another thing that this DOH guidance says is if you have a barrier, you can shorten that distance. Well, the buses, we put one in a seat unless they're from the same house. Um, if we could put two to a seat, yes, we could probably get everyone in. Um, if I can figure out a way to get a third bus run, yes, we could probably get everyone in. Can we ask parents too, if they're willing to bring kids you know, which ones would be what you have don't have jobs or jobs that accommodate to pick up and bring to get more kids. That's a common conversation every time we talk with moms and dads. Uh, because we get a lot of requests for not just coming back, but to increase in food affordance. And so I just I thought it was important that the board know we're trying, we're constantly evolving what we're doing to try to fit more kids. But until that, until things change with our regulations, we're stuck. Um, and I know, I know we're, they're trying to pack them in wherever they can. And we've got plans. If we go to three foot, we've got plans. We know how to do the cafeterias. We know how to do this, that, and the other thing. It's just the transportation is tiny, is a, is a tiny aspect for us. Jamie, could I, could I ask a question? So uh, if you can hear me okay. So the, if we move towards the three foot, which I know is, 
in, in the works right now. But the, the talk is not regarding physical education or the specialized subjects like music and art. And, and so your least common denominator, right? So if you still have to keep a six foot or a 12 foot distance in your specialized areas like PE or music, even though you could go three foot in your general ed classrooms, you're going to be you're going to be limited to the spacing requirements that you have in physical education or music to bring those students back. I've, I've noticed in other districts we've had issues where they bring students back to capacity in certain areas, but then they go to the specialized subjects and they're overflowed and they can't deal with the numbers that they have in those specialized areas because of the limitations for the 12 foot requirements required for the physical education or music. So dealing with the limitations of six or the changes from six to possibly three, have you heard anything in regards to the specialized subjects that require 12 as a recommendation to move to six or to move to three or have you heard anything on that front? It's a, that's a great question and we, we are looking at the possibilities. If we're able to move there, what can we do in some of the special areas? Um, I will say I haven't necessarily heard the specificity with 12 going down, but I, just from what we know with what we've learned through the contacting uh, tracing, contact tracing process, public health, once, you're, once you've been uh, talking for more than 10 minutes, your six foot is no longer six foot. It's, it's larger. So, um, if, if I were in a PE class sitting in the corner um, longer than 10 minutes, even if no one's within 30 feet of me, public health would probably quarantine me because I'm in that big room for longer than, than, than the prescribed time of like 10 or 15 minutes. I don't actually know where that 12 foot came in for those subject areas. Uh, I'm not necessarily in a full agreement with it. I will tell you that here we have specialized masks. We have uh, bags to go over instruments. Uh, I mean, we we really um, our our folks have really done what they could to mitigate the transfer of the virus if the virus walked in um, the door. But with the specificity of that 12 foot, no, I haven't heard anything, John. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't have. Well, I'm just saying. I mean, if they if they change the six to three, that's great for general ed. But if they don't change the twelve from PE or music, you're going to still be limited by your PE classes, especially with how many students you can fit in the building at a certain time to make. A, we only have so many PE teachers, and we're still at twelve foot. It's not going to really change how many we can, students we can fit in that area at the time uh, to make it make that make that up. Is uh, it'll be spring and hopefully warmer out, and they can get outside. Um, we do have the auditorium, the usage of the auditorium that's a big space. If we have 100 kids in forest, no, we probably still could put them in the auditorium, even with a three foot. Um, but, uh, but we're, you know, the creativity has to come out. Uh, can we run it at different times, you know, in different sections? I, I know that, I know that the administrators. They'll, they'll do what they can to try and figure it out if we can at all. But that's a huge concern, John. I get it. We don't want to shortchange any subject. When do you think you'll submit that poll to the executive Right now, it's just kind of, we're, we've been talking, and for the last week or so, we're just running up against the brick wall. And I'd like to, I'd like to let the CDC get a little bit further ahead. Um, so that I'm not out in front of them. Um, and, and once that happens, it might be a good time just to see what the community's thoughts are. And that's all my new reports. Thank you. Lisa, are you all done or do you have more to say? Lisa? I'm all set. Go on to action items. It looks like 5.01 and 5.12 are on the consent agenda. Does anybody want any of those polls for discussion? If not, I'll take a motion. Suzanne first. John second. All in favor? Like everybody. 
5.13 recommendation to approve the diesel fuel bill award uh, to MX Petroleum. I get a motion. John first. Suzanne second. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Rob, can you um, turn your camera on? We still have a quorum. Yep. Yep. Good job. Yep. Um, rec 5.14 um, recommendation to approve the gas bid award for to Arnold Oil. I got a motion. Suzanne first. Steve second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's everybody that's showing yep. the motion. Uh, 5.15 recommendation to approve the bus proposition resolution for 21 22. For three buses, can I get a motion, please? Suzanne first, Morella second. Any discussion on the buses? All in favor? We, we'll we'll so we're going to mark the garage. I'm sorry? We're going to work for the garage? Yes. Yep. Are you saying? Are the new buses going to be, we don't have to change it again? No, no, no. So, so you know. Yeah, the, we are in the capital project. We're going yeah. from the single doors to the double. Okay. Yeah, they sure. should be there. All in favor? Everybody? 5.16 recommendation to approve the legal notice for the budget hearing slash vote for 21 22. I get a motion, please. Suzanne first. Morella second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five point one seven um, recommendation to approve the BOCES commitment form as presented. I get a motion, please. Suzanne first. I get a second. Steve second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five point one eight recommendation to approve the gift back of unused snow days. Jamie had those pretty well detailed in the okay. I get a motion, please. Uh, first, Suzanne second. Any discussion on the get back days? All in favor? Yes. Rob's back. 5.19 recommendation to approve the substitutes for the 2021 school year as presented. Suzanne first. Second, John second, any discussion? All in favor? 5.20 recommendation to approve the appointment of coaches for the 2021 winter season. Motion, please. John first, Suzanne second, any discussion? Morella? Mm, I have a quick question. So I can't find the date. So fall, fall to season. Um, when does that start, Jamie? I don't have that. Uh, goodness. I believe it starts um, a week before the end of March. Okay. I think there's equal overlap between fall to and winter. So then the winter two, I mean, fall two is also going to overlap with the spring sports. Yes. And right. our, uh, there, the section is going to allow students to participate in both at the same time if there is an overlap. So, um, so many of their fall two practices will count for going into um, their spring season so that if they play modified basketball, say, but wanted to do outdoor track, they wouldn't be behind any of the other athletes that didn't do fall two in, lot, in, in the guise of minimum number of required practices. So yeah, they're trying to squeeze the season in about five weeks for the modifieds. Okay, thanks, just wondering. I can, I can get those dates and send them out to you also. Um, 
No big deal. That's fine. Uh, Jamie, I noticed an interesting article today regarding availability of testing accommodations in the fall two season. Do, I'm, I'm not sure the viability of that story. Do you have any information on that? Well, uh, we don't test our students right now, our student athletes, but I will tell you that uh, the county had, do you remember that uh, micro cluster initiative that the governor had? Uh, and if we were deemed yellow, we get we have to test our students. So the county uh, was sent uh, a pile of these tests, and they had them. Uh, so when we started talking about uh, the possibility of winter sports, the idea of testing came up, and a couple of districts did move forward with it. The county, with with the massive tests that they had. Uh, they had a huge portion of those tests that we were, would need to get used within a week or so because their expiration was up. Um, the schools that are testing ordered from the county, how many they need, um, and, and the expiration date on the remaining tests may be blooming. That may be what initiated the conversation uh, that got into the paper. I don't know. That's a little speculation. I know that the two districts between the two, uh, they're not using a pile of tests, but I'm assuming there's an expiration. Uh, we were told the expiration is coming for a lot of them. I would assume the rest of them are expiring. And then it's uh, to get those tests, if we didn't get them free um, from the county, would be about $5 um, a test. And that was the best price we saw. Any other discussion? All in favor? 5.21 recommendation to approve the appointment of coaches for the 2021 spring season's pending sports approval. We have a motion, please. John Furr, Suzanne Sackett, and Morella. All in favor? Everybody. 5.22, recommendation to approve unpaid volunteer assistance for the 2021 spring season pending requirements met, professional conduct display, and sport approval. That would be Mike Lejean for baseball. We had a motion, please. Yeah. And, and, oh, and there's a Darrell. Yeah, yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Sorry, but I should. So Mike Lejean and Michelle Darrell. And Suzanne Burst. John second. Any discussion? All in favor? Don't see anybody opposed. 5.23 recommendation to approve the appointment of athletic and tech supervisors for the 2021 school year at a rate of $35 per day if needed. The Aqua Gobber Street is that point. Can get a motion, please? Suzanne first. Get a second. John, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Stay in the seat. Yeah. Do you have it, Joe? <laughs> Uh, 5.24 recommendation to approve appointments of the extended day staff for 2021 school year at rates determined by the extended day grant. Um, Hardigan, St. Andrews, and Dion. I get a motion, please. Steve first, Suzanne second. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Five point two five recommendation to approve the appointment of a long term substitute for approximately March 9th, June 25th. Burn elementary teacher, uh, Megan Biggs. We got a motion, please. 
John first. Steve second. Any discussion? All in favor? Five point two six recommendation to approve the family medical leave from approximately February 9th to March 28th for a fundamental monitor. That is um, Janet Aldridge. We have a motion, please. Morella first. Second. Steve second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Uh, 5.27 recommendation to approve the family medical leave from approximately March 5th to March 19th for a bus monitor, cafeteria monitor, Chris Ward. And a motion, please. Suzanne first, Steve second. Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? 5.27 recommendation approved the family medical leave from approximately April 12th to May 17th for a bus driver slash cafeteria monitor, Julie Yando. I get a motion, please. Suzanne first. Steve second. Um, I guess my only question is it looks like we're losing bus driver, bus monitor. I hope that goes back to Stanley. I'm sure you're. I'm sure you got it all figured out. But. <laughs> I, I, you have placed a lot of faith in me. Uh, we are working on uh, getting more people into stuff. All right, good luck. Thank you. Any more discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? 5.29 recommendation to approve the family medical leave from approximately May 3rd through June 25th for a keyboard specialist slash secretary. Kristen Austin. Can I get a motion, please? Morella first. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? 5.30 uh, recommendation to approve the appointment of a long term substitute from approximately May 3rd through June 25th for a secondary keyboard specialist. Noel Dominey, John first, second, Amy second, any discussion, John, all in favor, anybody opposed, 5.31 recommendation to approve the retirement resignation of a head mechanic, effective June 29th, Bill Meter. We get a motion, please. Suzanne first. Okay, second. Steve second. Discussion. I have a um, just a question and a and a maybe slash comment. Um, so I know that you will be probably searching Jamie. I'm assuming and posting the, the you know the job description. Is it possible to, um, you know, revise the job description? Because it appears to me that, you know, Bill's been there for many, many years and, you know, wore different hats and things like that. And so this is our opportunity to get rid of the stipend if possible and make that part of the job description. And, you know, just... I just feel like there's all these stipends and people, uh, you know, assume these different responsibilities and I get it. But, you know, when we, um, you know, when, when, when we're getting a new position or, you know, trying to hire somebody, you know, to replace as a replacement, then we need to rethink um, the job description and maybe fit it better where we don't have to, um, you know, go back and pay different stipends and things. Just something to consider as we write a job description for, you know, uh, the replacement. Uh, thanks, Morello. I, I would say that uh, that job description needs to be reworked uh, regardless of that stipend, but that is a good idea to bring that in. Uh, Bill does do mainly supervisory issues and, and his title of job mechanic may not apply. Uh, we're working with civil service as best we can.
can to maximize the pool of candidates. Um, but uh, that's not a bad idea. I know that a lot of people that might be interested probably wouldn't have 19A supervisory certification. Um, so that that could limit our pool, but it is something that certainly we can look at. We can look at job descriptions whenever we want, even after we hire, make it a condition of continued employment if, if such. But that's not a bad idea. Is there, is there, you can hire and, and I think it's for the third to have one year to complete that exam. And if that's the case, how are they going to be kept during that time frame? So if we got somebody that was not on the exam on the list, um, we would have to conditionally appoint them. Uh, the one year is suspect to when they give the test. So yes, if they give a regular test, there's some there's some uh, competitive classes that do give regular tests. Transportation director is not one of them. But yeah, we would it would be a condition that they would not only have to take the test, they'd have to, I believe, score in the top three or be accessible off the list. I believe that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, John. Oh, uh, two comments. One. Um, I want to make sure the board sends Bill a special special note for the years of service and uh, his, his exceptional ability and service to our school district and uh, his, his irreplaceable knowledge and, and dedication. It's going to be tough to replace that position. Number two, the stipend issue. Um, it does require advanced certification in this, in this position. And so we do need to make sure that if we redo rework the job description, that that is that is effective in there, and understand that people have put extra time and money to get that certification in that position. Make sure we compensate them for that. Any other discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Five point three two recommendation to approve the appointment of a school nurse at the contractual rate after hours during the twenty twenty one spring season as needed. We get a motion, please. John first. Amy second. Any discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Sure. Six point oh. New report. Motion to annual meeting. Yep, that's just it, that the annual meeting will be on Monday, April 19th. Um, is that live or is that the same meeting? Um, uh, I'm sorry, the April 19th is when we have to have the meeting. Um, the annual meeting I'm looking is Tuesday, April 13th. I'm going to assume that it is a virtual, although I have not, I haven't heard. Um, with possible Zoom, so I don't know if they're going to try to have it in person. Okay. Um, I would hope that if we can do in person, we would because they really have delicious desserts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and any, uh, I would uh, go so far as uh, any board member who would like to attend, whether in person or Zoom, please let me know. I, they like to get a head count ahead of time. It's a great uh, meeting uh, to kind of understand the administrative portion of the policy of budget, which our board has to vote for. So uh, DS Burns does go through it pretty well. Uh, he usually has a couple of his uh, folks do pre quick presentations, uh, but it, it, you leave kind of with an understanding of that executive, or I'm sorry, that administrative portion of the budget which we have to vote for. So please let me know if you have any uh, thoughts about attending on April 13th. Um, and if it's in person, then I'll join you. Not in communication. Um, so there was no possible comments. No. Um, any board comments? We are going to go into an executive session. Anybody have any board comments they'd like to? Seeing none. No. Okay. Um, so we're going to, I need a motion to go into executive discussion to discuss the um, tenure recommendation. 
performance of probationary teachers? Performance? Okay. Really, you got yep. That. Yep. So can I get a, somebody make Susan will make that motion? I get a second. And all in favor? And I'm going to thank everybody else for attending.